thank you, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and congratulations to you for uh, and your service as, uh, as president of this uh, unruly group. <laughs> it's a great uh, pleasure for me to be here today and be able to share some some time and some thoughts with you on the increasingly critical question of mental health across the country. Uh, as uh, has been said. We all come to this issue with a variety of experiences. Um, I think it's important for us to realize that it's not just about personal anecdotes, but without the personal awareness of how mental health issues affect all of us, uh, we aren't really going to be able to launch, continue to push for the kind of transformation that we're beginning to see in Canada, but we need to keep pushing for uh, right, across, right across the board. So at the risk of embarrassing myself and all of you, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit of the narrative of my uh, experience with mental illness. Uh, and it, it's taken me a while to feel, and I still don't feel totally comfortable talking about it, but it's taken me a while to break down some of the barriers that still exist in, in talking about it. Uh, there are people in my family and people in, uh, who are among my friends who say if you talk about it, uh, people will immediately think that you're crazy and you have a vulnerability and it's, you're supposed to be perfect, um, particularly um, as you're striving for public office. Well, I have the advantage of having made so many mistakes in my political career <laughs> that no one is under the illusion that I am perfect. Uh, and having contested twice for the leadership of the Liberal Party in Canada and not having succeeded, uh, when I received the prize of becoming the interim uh, leader of the party, which was, I said at the time, I said I always wanted to be leader of the Liberal Party in the worst way, <laughs> and, like and so, at that point, I said, you know, there are two issues that I want to talk to Canadians about, using what Theodore Roosevelt called the bully pulpit of leadership to talk about issues that matter to me. The first one was about mental health, the second was about our continuing need for reconciliation between those of us who've come in the last few hundred years and those Canadians who've been here for thousands and thousands of years, and how difficult that reconciliation is proving to be and how important it remains. And as you'll hear from my talk today, uh, I believe these two issues are actually very closely connected. They're not disconnected from, uh, from one another. Uh, Iowa was the product of a very uh, happy family, uh, and a very successful family. Uh, my father was a, a Canadian diplomat. My mother uh, was highly educated and still alive today and is still watching and following uh, what's going on in the world. And still very much the center of our, of our family life. Uh, went to university, uh, did very well on a scholarship to Oxford, uh, did just fine. Uh, started my graduate studies, uh, and I can't quite describe the point of the moment that it happened, but it had to do with flying back and forth between uh, England and Canada, and perhaps, you know, some kind of physical fatigue or something uh, allowed things to start to become unraveled. But uh, I began to experience a sense of profound uh, isolation and anxiety. Uh, that I'd never experienced before, and that was different than anything I had, uh, I had faced in my, uh, in my life. I had always been a very uh, successful and relatively happy uh, person. I had moments of, uh, of reflection, uh, which made people think that I was sometimes a little, a little odd or apart, but this was, this was a different uh, type of experience. Luckily, I was living with friends, uh, and they immediately recognized that something had changed. It wasn't, you know, just somebody being grumpy or sad. It was something quite, quite odd. I couldn't sleep. Uh, I was walking around the city at all times of the day and night. Um, uh, 
We have a very great deal of difficulty following conversations, participating in social conversations. And it was immediately suggested by one of my friends who's gone on to become a doctor that I should be getting medical help. And so I went to see someone and the doctor said, well, you know, we have a couple of pills we can give you. Do you want to do that? And I said, no, I really don't want to do that. Um, I just as soon talk to somebody. So I arranged to talk to a therapist over a period of about six or eight months and, and slowly but surely began to make certain decisions about my life and what I would do and how I would emerge from this period of time. And in the course of that, I wrote a lot of letters and kept a diary. And as I was cleaning out the basement, well, sort of cleaning out the basement, it's a life Long. <laughs> <laughs> and they discovered Saddam Hussein in Iraq. My daughter, Eleanor, my youngest daughter, phoned up and said, Dad, what was Saddam Hussein's biggest mistake? And she said, I said, I have no idea. He said, he didn't hide out in our basement. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this cleaning is an ongoing effort. But I, I happened to come across a box um, and uh, was looking through the box and, and saw, realized that some of it was this diary that I had kept in keeping in. And my letters that I sent to my parents, my mother had sent back. Uh, later, many years later, she said, you may want to keep these. I don't, you know, they're yours. And we've all been through it, so it's fine. And well, a couple of things were very interesting. One is just this incessant kind of uh, self-reflection. And also, the, the other one was that the script was smaller and smaller and smaller. Almost to the point where, you, you know, I, I, it was very, very difficult to decipher. So it's, it's going to go into an archive somewhere and somebody in 20 or 30 years is going to write a paper on it or something. I don't know. Um, my point is this. It was a deeply troubling experience. I can joke about it and t talk about it now, but at the time it was, I, I felt like my whole life was, was over. Um, and when I came back to Canada and began working as a community worker and as a law student and was teaching and was doing more and engaging more, engaging more. I was trying to find a way to integrate what had happened to me with what else I was doing. Uh, and I've really been trying to do that ever since. I've been trying to say, well, how do I let people know this happened to me and it's, it's, it's a it's something that I experienced and it had a major impact on me. It changed some life decisions that I made. Uh, it made me realize a lot of things about myself, about my, my own drive to, to perfection, uh, that I always had this thing on my shoulder telling me that I could do better and better and better, and how the only person who could get rid of that bird on my shoulder was me. There was nobody else who could take it away from me. I had to do it myself, figure out. I, I was setting the stand. Nobody else was setting these standards for me. I was setting it for myself. And so I've done my best to carry on with the political work that I've always believed in and felt was important and enjoyed and uh, realized that in some cases and times and ways was good at it. Uh, but I also felt that it was important in the area of public policy to make some changes. So when I was finally given the opportunity to be in government in Ontario, spent a lot of time focusing on how in healthcare we could make certain changes and how certain changes needed to go even further. And I'm going to talk about that in just, a, in just a moment. And then in Parliament to try to, in, in, in the legislature of Ontario, to talk about the issues in a way that people would feel they were less uh, alone, that they weren't on their own, that they were actually uh, with other people in going through the suffering that they were that people are going through. And I think over a period of time, in the last 30 years in my public life, I've seen a transformation, the beginning of a transformation, between people feeling that these are issues that are best left in the privacy of family and not to be discussed publicly, to being issues that require a public recognition. And I've been trying to figure out in my own in my own way what is it that continues to make mental health so different from physical health in our willingness to understand it, 
in our willingness to address it, and in our willingness to do something about it. Now, every single person in this room is probably more qualified than your honorary president to tell you why this is. But I'm going to give you my point of view anyway, uh, because you've very generously flown me here so that I can talk to you today. The first is, and, and, this, and really the question is not just about society, but it's about governments. Why do governments have such a hard time really embracing not only talking about mental health, but also doing something about it in a systematic way. And the first reason, obviously, is that while we have reduced the stigma, we have not eliminated the stigma. Uh, and we need to understand that. We need to understand that there is still a profound stigma about mental health that is different from the way in which we look at physical health. Although, anybody will tell you that the world of physical health and mental health is coming together all the time. And as we begin to understand the dynamics of the body and the dynamics of the brain, we begin to understand more and more how these two things are connected. The brain is part of our body. Now, I'm not even remotely qualified to talk about the difference between the brain and the, and the mind. But suffice it to say that in the field of psychological research, and the work that you do, and the work that the medical profession does, and everybody is doing, we are constantly seeing how these two things are connected. So it's impossible for us to imagine a well person who is physically well, but psychologically distraught. Because that person is unwell. So I don't even like to talk anymore about mental health. I just like to talk about health, well-being. How are we doing? And I have a test that I sometimes apply to politicians. It drives them crazy when I see them, because I say, how are you doing? Fine. How are you sleeping? What? <laughs> what are you talking about? a very personal question. I said, well, the first year I was premier, I hardly slept. And it took me a long time to figure out how to find the right balance in my life that would allow me to cope with all this additional pressure and obligation that I suddenly felt becoming the first minister of a province that was going through a dramatic recession. So I, when I look at a leader now, I always ask myself the question, How's he or she doing? How are you doing? And it's not about, you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fine, my heart's going well, my, you know, that. no, no, it all goes together, it all connects. And perhaps the first way we can deal with the stigma about mental health and mental illness is just to say it's all health and it's all illness. And it's all well-being. well-being. But we continue to need to fight on this question of stigma and shame and embarrassment. Because it is, it is such a terrible thing for people to feel a sense of shame or embarrassment about how they are. And we all know the costs and consequences of that shame and that embarrassment. I mean, it's what we've seen, what we as a society now, because of social media, what we all see today is in so many cases just heart-wrenching. Because suddenly lives are on the screen, right? And they're on, they're on, our, they're on our Blackberries and our... Sorry, I have to use the word Blackberry because I'm... Hey, no, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> so it's still the word that I use. But on our smartphones and everything, they're, they're, we are suddenly seeing through Twitter and Facebook we're seeing a, a degree of, of social revolution and self-effacement that we've never really seen before as a, as a society. And in some ways it's quite amazing and marvelous, in other ways it's, it's, it's just so difficult to watch 
how people are coping and how they're trying to cope with the trauma and the, and the, and the sense of shame and embarrassment that people feel from going through what they're going through. Making mistakes, making mistakes in public. You know, everything, all the mistakes that are committed now are committed way out there in public. So it's very hard for people to cope with this degree of, of, uh, of revelation that we're going through. The second reason why governments have such a hard time coping and responding to the challenge of wellness is because there's a fear in government. And I think it's a fear that's actually not just sort of among bureaucrats, but it's actually a fear in public opinion. That the trouble with trying to solve people's personal problems is that there's no cure. And it relates to the stigma, but the stigma is once you've got it, you've got it and you'll never get better. And once you've been labeled as something, and I know the question of labeling and you know what is what have you got? <laughs> For all I know, somebody here is saying, Mr. Ray, you had this. I said, I don't know. <laughs> it's because there's a sense that you've got it for life. The same way that in the 50s, I can remember my parents would say about someone, oh, he has it. What was it? Cancer. But the word was so bad that you never have actually mentioned the word cancer. Sometimes they'd say the C word. C word. Like kids are thinking, what's a C word? I'm thinking of all the awful words you can think of. <laughs> None of which were in. Well, now we've begun to overcome that, right? With respect to some, some forms of physical illness, we say, well, actually, you, you know, you can get better. You can, you can be cured. Uh, and you can, we've succeeded in changing what were acute illnesses into chronic illnesses, which is the, the amazing revolution in healthcare that's taken place in, in a, so many countries around the world. But with the challenge of mental wellness, there's a deep fear that once you've got it, you're done. And so if governments say, well, we're going to try to solve this, well, then they realize, well, holy smokes, we've got to deal with housing, and we've got to deal with health care, we've got to deal with social issues, we've got to deal with employment. This is way too expensive and way too complicated. It can't be done. And so mental health has been hived off into kind of a field of, we're not quite sure what to do about this. And the more we identify it, the more expensive it's going to become for governments. And so let's, let's just keep it where it is. But do you know what's happened? What's happened is that there's so much growing evidence, and I know it's, it's not really, in Ottawa, you're not really allowed to talk about it. The evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Here we are. In the of the now, I'm some kind of a radical guy because right now I'm defending the Enlightenment. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> it's kind of bizarre what's happening with all the policy. But the evidence is absolutely overwhelming that so many treatments are effective and so many people get better and so many people are in effect cured although I think we have to recognize that we're all struggling and facing our own challenges and that it's not as if there's a kind of a when you're well and you're sick we know better than that we know there's a continuum of wellness. How are you doing? How are you coping? How are you managing? And it's not as if mental illness is all one thing where we put everybody off in a corner, or as happened in the 19th century, you build these huge institutions and you throw people in them and lock the door. Now, the problem today is that we unlock the doors in the, starting in the 70s and 80s, 
A lot of this was a parallel time with my time in public office. And governments did not then say, well, we can't just fill people up with pills and let them wander on the streets and say, hey, we're much better off than we had these big sanatoriums and these big institutions. We're way better off. And now we realize that mental health is not something that's off in the corner somewhere. It's everywhere and it's all around us. And that's what makes it critical for us to engage in this, in this continuing effort, this continuing campaign to shed light, to shed information, to share knowledge, to share awareness, and to make sure that everyone in our society is included. And that we can identify those groups of people and those, those age groups and those age experiences which can often lead to the experience of, of really being unwell. And this is part of, this is a wonderful project for us all to be engaged in and involved in. And I'm so glad that your president talked today about the silo problem because if I had to say what is the biggest challenge in government and public policy today, it is the challenge of silos. Government departments like to think in silos. They like to control things by way of silos. And they don't see these things as part of a continuum and as part of a broad public effort that needs to happen. I don't mean to attack any one profession, but I will say this. Psychiatry and the medical profession on their own cannot solve the problem of mental unwellness. They can't. <laughs> and psychologists on their own can't deal with it. Nurses on their own can't deal with it. The healthcare system on its own can't deal with it. It requires the broadest social effort that you could possibly imagine. I spent much of the last year working with First Nations in the far north of Ontario and remote communities and, and in British Columbia as well. And there are huge issues around wellness. They're physical, they're mental, they're spiritual, they're social, they're psychological. If a community has 90% unemployment, 90% absence from getting any recognition for the life that you're leading. We look at the trauma of what generations went through with residential schools and think somehow that, well, we've apologized for that, so that's over. And you know, my least favorite word when dealing with all these social issues is the word closure. Oh, we've got closure on that now. I, I, none of us has closure. We just, we just cope with it, right? We just manage our way through it. It doesn't disappear, the loss of a loved one, some you know, stupid mistake you made 30 years ago, something that's happened there. Do these things ever disappear? No, they don't disappear. They're still there. It's all about how you cope with it, manage your way through them. So to sort of argue that this generation of First Nations, we've had closure on the residential school system, no. This was a societal harm that was done over an entire century. And the century before that, we weren't doing so well either. So you have several centuries where, where the dominant group, where the European settlers and other settlers have, have basically ignored, despised, discriminated, forgotten, abandoned, stereotyped, a whole group of people, and you say, well, sorry about that, we didn't mean it, we're sorry, it's done. I mean, this is, this is something where there's, there's a reconciliation is the hard part. We're right now, we're in the truth and indignation phase. We're not in the truth and reconciliation phase. We haven't come close to that yet. We're in the indignation phase because there's so much hurt and anger and frustration. And we can't get to the next phase. And that's where, frankly, it's going to take all of our efforts to do that. And that's why we have to break down the silos. You have to look at it. Work, recognition, respect, dignity, self-government. Well, where do you start? 
And then you have to deal with the, the, each individual case that, that's out there and try to figure out a way of, of helping people to, to live lives where they feel respected and, and dignified. In order for that to happen, everybody in a sense has to change, has to be part of that process of understanding the, the transformation that needs to happen. And it's not about categorizing things in, in narrow boxes or putting them in little silos. It's about understanding how each, each of us and each in our professional life and in our working life has something to offer as part of teams, as part of ways in which we address these questions. There aren't enough doctors to provide the kind of care and therapy that needs to be provided on an individual basis. So the big challenge facing our healthcare system today is going to be this, right across the country. If we say that mental health is as much a part of the healthcare system as physical health, then how can we make sure that all those professionals who are providing that kind of help are in fact recognized as full partners in the healthcare system. How can we do that happen? If the only way you can get health insurance, public health insurance, for individual therapy is by going to a doctor, the effect of that is abandoning 60-70% of those who are seeking help from getting access to public insurance. And just as we now discover that, you know, we have huge barriers to cross with dental care, we have barriers to cross in mental care, and we have barriers to cross when it comes to access to the appropriate level of medication, the appropriate kind of medication. And so there's work to be done. There's so much work for pu public policy to address, for people to address, for people to engage. And that's where every, everyone who knows and is aware of the issues and the problems has an obligation to say, how can we move this forward together? To insist that the political parties address these questions in a mature and thoughtful and effective way to make sure that there's a reasoned conversation about what it's going to take to, to make us into a healthy candidate, a well candidate. And that is, yes, it's about the Clara Hughes doing her cycling, and it's about raising money, and it's about Bell Canada doing its awareness, it's about all those companies and others that are engaged and moving forward. And yes, we have moved the yardsticks dramatically from where they were even 20 or 30 years ago. We have moved them, we are moving them. But we still have a long way to go. And we need to recognize and cast as much light as we can on how we can, in fact, move forward. It's interesting that in Parliament the last two years we've had two or three debates. Oh, that's my mistake. <laughs> Somebody recognizing the debate that's not there, I better say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to turn this off that quickly, but I'll try to do so. The merit point's there. <laughs> we, we have to understand that we move the yardsticks in terms of rhetoric and culture, but we have not done so in terms of policy because policy is more difficult. Policy is harder to do. And it requires more than rhetoric. As I was mentioning in Parliament, we've had three separate debates on suicide. That would never have happened 20 years ago. Never. No, no party would have touched it. They would have said, hey, 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 there's no quotes there. Don't, don't talk about that. that that's changed. But, but the policies of saying, well, how do we have a more effective national strategy on wellness and by implication, how do we have a more effective strategy on suicide prevention? 
because as my friends have pointed out, it, suicide is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the, it's the worst traumatic result possible in dealing with, uh, with the issue of, of, of health. But at least we're talking about it. At least we're engaging in it. At least we're beginning to understand that it needs to happen. I want to just wrap up by saying that I hope you will see your own obligation as being part of this national effort that's required. And I hope you will also feel that you're not alone if you're occasionally frustrated in trying to deal with the challenges that you have to deal with. The systems that you have to work around to get your clients the kind of care and attention that they need. The frustration with the waiting lists that are there for kids, that are there for older people, that are there for people coming out of the military, and all of the evidence that we see where we just can't get people into the care that they need. Two things that I've tried to emphasize in this talk today. First of all, that we've got to keep fighting the stigma. In every way that we can, by sharing our stories, by talking about what we do, by encouraging others who feel even for a moment that somehow they're shamed in their problem or their condition or their challenge. There is no shame. And the second is that, as hard as it is to believe this, we're actually better off than we were 10 or 20 years ago that we've made more progress in terms of the kind of care that we can provide, that we are breaking down some of the barriers of knowledge and understanding, that all the research that is being done is actually producing results and getting us to a better place than we might otherwise have been. And so I leave you with those thoughts and would ask you to join with me and with a whole bunch of other people across the country who see this as the great challenge that we face as a country. The challenge of making sure that everyone can live in dignity. The challenge of making sure that everyone can aspire to wellness and to good health. And the challenge of making sure that we are a country that will rid us forever of the notion that there is any cause for shame or embarrassment because we've encountered some of the things that make us unwell and because we have not always proven to be equal to the task of overcoming them on their own. It takes a, a village, as Hillary Clinton has said and others have said, it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a country to help us all stay well. We've built that country quite successfully, but we can't take anything for granted and we have to keep on building. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it.